Well, Jamie Hinn is the director of Fossil Free Media, where he's helped launch campaigns like Clean Creatives and Stop Stop the Oil Profiteering, which we'll talk about on the show today. But Jamie, welcome to the Climate Pod. It's great to be with you. Well, it's so great to have you on. You know, you've had this long, fascinating career in the climate movement. Now I can say it's been a long career, Jamie, because you know you've been at this for a while. Let's talk about your background. How did you initially get into climate? Oh, my word, back in the dark ages. Um, So I I first got into climate change when I was in college um, back in sort of 2004, 2005, which was, you know, one of the early waves of climate awareness. This is right when an inconvenient truth came out and people were starting to really pay attention to climate as an issue separate from other environmental concerns. And so, you know, I was really lucky to be involved in one of the first waves of student activism activism on campuses. We were trying to convince our universities to go carbon neutral and and begin to address this global crisis that we saw. Um, And out of that activism on campus and connecting with other students nationwide, began to really see the potential for a movement that was distinct from traditional environmentalism, but really was something focused on climate and climate justice. And so a group of friends and I partnered with a writer, Bill McKibben, who happened to be a scholar in residence up at our college in Vermont. And um, with Bill, just basically started organizing with no idea of what we were doing and um, ended up pulling off a big national day of action called Step It Up in 2007. And then that transitioned into a global day of action, um, which became 350.org. It was like a rocket ship from there. We kept organizing different global demonstrations and campaigns. And lo and behold, here we are, you know, some 15 years later, uh, still edit and still trying to find ways to make trouble. So it's been a great, you know, decade plus now, it's hard to believe um, in the climate movement and, and getting to take part in a lot of different efforts out there to really try and see what we can do to apply people power to the largest challenge I think we're facing as a species. And one of those efforts that you've embarked on in recent years is starting up Fossil Free Media. What is Fossil Free Media? Sure. So, you know, a lot of my work at 350.org over a decade was thinking about the ways that communications could help support a effective and strategic climate movement. And so at the end of 2019, we just wrapped up helping support the global climate strikes um, and just saw the incredible wave of activity that had taken place thanks to young people leading that charge. And so it felt to me like a good opportunity to take a step back after a decade or so at 350 and really start a program that was exclusively focused on trying to change the conversation around fossil fuels. And so we operate at Fossil Free Media as a sort of nonprofit media lab. And we work in a couple different areas. One is support supporting grassroots groups and national coalitions here in the US to try and really make progress on stopping fossil fuel infrastructure and moving the political dial to address the fossil fuel industry. And then the other side of our operation is really focused on disrupting the industry's ability to push out its own propaganda and dominate the narrative around fossil fuels and climate. So we operate in both of those directions, both trying to sort of promote the incredible grassroots leadership that's happening all across this country to free us from fossil fuels, and then also really try and tackle the different ways that the industry puts out disinformation and dominates the public conversation. And so we're kind of at that interesting nexus of campaigning and media and communications and and really trying to experiment. You know, we take that lab part of our name seriously um, with different campaigns and techniques and technologies that can try and make progress on this public conversation about what needs to be done to address the climate crisis. There is a massive public conversation going on around energy prices, as you well know. This is at the top of people's mind. I mean, I was t- seeing this this weekend. You know, we're talking right before Memorial Day weekend when gas prices are going up even higher. And this puts an, an enormous burden on people, especially low-income people, uh, when it comes to needing to uh, you know, get access to transportation. And this is all happening while we know we have to decarbonize immediately and get off of fossil fuels. You've launched this incredible campaign called STOP, which stands for Stop the Oil Profiteering. What is the purpose of this campaign and, and why now? Sure. So we you know, saw that even before the war in Ukraine, as gas prices were going up, the fossil fuel industry was really mobilizing to try and take advantage of this moment. And even though they're directly responsible for this price increase by throttling supply themselves and taking advantage of then 
the war in Ukraine when it broke out, you know, they were really coming out with a lot of propaganda saying that gas prices were going up because of climate policies, because of the Biden administration cracking down on prices. And so we saw this beginning to roll out and said, this is a huge problem. You know, much of the climate movement had been focused on trying to pass legislation in Congress and therefore wasn't out there contesting this narrative in the public space. And so we saw both an immense threat that high gas prices posed, um, knowing it was going to be on the top of minds for voters, but also a real opportunity here to harness public anger and explain to people that, hey, this industry is profiteering from the war in Ukraine and intentionally gouging you at the gas pump to make billions in profits. So we quickly, over the course of a week, you know, scrambled together to launch this campaign called Stop the Oil Profiteering, which has a nice acronym, which we always like, uh, STOP, and got that up quickly. And it has two purposes. You know, one is to really try and be a vehicle for pushing back on this false narrative the industry is pushing about what's causing high gas prices. And so in the very name is the way that we're trying to point a finger and say, look, this is profiteering. This is war profiteering as we have come to understand it. And then second, it's to push a real solution that would help make progress on this, which is a windfall profits tax. And the idea of that is that we would put a tax on the oil industry's attempts to profiteer off this crisis. And there's a few different technical ways of doing it, but the basic idea is that you either take the average price per barrel of oil over the last five years or the average profits the industry's made, and then anything above that that they're making because of the war in Ukraine and this unique situation, you put a tax on it. And that tax could range from 50% to Bernie Sanders has suggested 90%, which we like, of course, as well. And then you take that revenue, which could be in the tens of billions of dollars here in the United States, and you dividend it back to people and say, look, why should big oil CEOs be pocketing billions more in profits that they don't need off a crisis they helped create? Instead, let's send that to low-income, moderate-income families um, as a direct dividend that they can use to offset the price at the pump or use to you know, any other purpose as well, maybe even energy efficiency or trying to get off fossil fuels entirely. And so it's basically a way to make sure that we're not incentivizing more production to deal with this crisis, which won't help, but that we're helping cushion people through what the industry is intentionally making a rocky transition away from fossil fuels. And so I think it's both an important mechanism in this particular moment on gas prices, but it's also a way for us to start thinking about how are we going to make this transition when you have an industry which is going to intentionally use every global crisis it can to sabotage the transition to clean energy? Yeah, it's fascinating. And I want to go back. I really want to talk about the big oil windfall profits tax and kind of where that is with, within Congress. But to step back a little bit, let's talk, uh, let's talk more about what fossil fuel companies are doing wrong in this. You mentioned kind of throttling supply. As you know, on a lot of right-wing television shows and a lot of uh, conservative media, there's a ton of misinformation about pipelines, the Keystone XL pipelines, which I know you've done a ton of amazing work on, that is often being blamed as a reason why energy prices in the United States are going up. You mentioned throttling supply that is occurring with, with fossil fuel companies. Like, why, like what, is, what are big oil companies exactly doing wrong right now? Yeah, so let's let's go back and sort of tell the actual story of how we got to this moment. You know, it, it, it really begins in two different important places. The first is the decades-long history of Western oil companies like Exxon, Chevron, Shell, working with Putin to strengthen Russian oil and gas production. Russia, coming out of the end of the Cold War, had an oil and gas you know, sector, but it was really antiquated, inefficient, not a top producer. And so they relied on Western companies, ExxonMobil in particular, to come into Russia and modernize its production, give it the technology to expand it to the Arctic, and open up the type of agreements that allowed Russia to get a corner on the market in Europe and worldwide. That's why the former CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson, who went on to become our Secretary of State, which in itself is an emblematic of the industry's connection to our government, um, he got the order of friendship from Vladimir Putin um, you know, for all of this work. And so the oil companies you know, want to bury that side of the story. Now they're banging their chest saying that they're going to help us get off Russian oil. But of course, they're deeply responsible for the problem that we find ourselves in. So that's one piece of the story that the oil industry has always worked with murderous dictatorships around the world to entangle us in these situations that then cause these rapid price increases when things go wrong. 
The other piece of the story is really domestic here in the United States. The oil industry, you know, coming out of the financial crisis in 2008, and the response that the federal government had to that suddenly had access to a lot of cheap capital. And what they did was burn it. <laughs> they used that money to rapidly try and expand fracking and oil and gas development across the United States, flooding the market with supplies, and then ultimately pressuring the Obama administration to lift the crude export ban so that we could be shipping oil around the world. And so we went way out on a limb of production here, an unnecessary production that led to an incredible increase in carbon dioxide as well. That production was never profitable. And so for a decade, these companies weren't making money. They were just burning through it, drilling new wells, not returning value to shareholders. And so once COVID hit, those companies were under incredible pressure from the shareholders and you know, rich sort of venture capital on Wall Street to say, look, no more of this, <laughs> you know, no more of burning through our money. We want you to basically give us the types of returns that we wanted over the last decade. And so when the war in Ukraine hit, there was this perfect nexus for the industry to say, great, you know, we can take advantage of this crisis, which we know is going to drive up oil prices because Russian oil is going to be off the market and the international price is going to be disrupted. And then we can also use this as an opportunity to return money to our wealthy investors by saying, we're not going to increase supply. We're not going to come out of COVID and turn on the wells that we made idle during the pandemic. And that will drive up the price and that will return immense value to our shareholders, which is paid for by people paying higher prices at the pump and on our home heating bills. How do we know all this? This isn't like a conspiracy theory. This is exactly what the CEOs have said on their earning calls to their investors. And they've been proud about it. Uh, you know, They've said, look at our brilliant strategy. We've intentionally throttled supply to drive up prices to return billions to your pockets. And so you know, it's, it's a complete myth that what's holding back the industry is a lack of production capacity or a lack of potential permits. They're sitting on tens of thousands of permits on public lands. And at the same time, most production happens on private lands anyway. So they've got an incredible amount of, you know, excess capacity that they could be using. Now, from a climate perspective, we don't necessarily want them drilling every last well. I mean, our goal is to ultimately have just enough supply to make it so that people don't have to pay high prices and then rapidly do everything we can to get off of fossil fuels. But again, the industry knows that. And so they're really taking advantage of this crisis to drive up prices and use it as a political cudgel to go after climate policy and everything that we can do. And so, you know, it, it, it's not, it doesn't even take investigative journalists to figure this out. I mean, this is really pretty much in broad daylight, but the industry has such a propaganda machine. And I think Democrats in particular are often very scared of taking on big oil that we're leaving this political space vacant. And so that's one of the goals of our campaign is to really try and get the truth out there and get climate advocates and our allies in Congress to take a more aggressive stance, to point a finger at big oil and say, these companies are intentionally profiteering. They're intentionally making billions off your back. And we have a way to begin to hold them accountable. Yeah. And it's it, it's one of those crazy things when you get into misinformation, which is, you know, you're doing such great work to combat, like going back to the you know, the Keystone XI, XL pipeline, that was never functional, right? That wasn't like, that was not, a, uh, this is, that has no impact on global energy prices. Biden climate plans, again, we've not passed a major climate bill in Congress. We've not gotten the things that we need in order to decarbonize, but it creates this unbelievable boogeyman, especially in right-wing media. But I think that you see that getting into more centrist media as well, people starting talking about exactly what you're, what you're saying, which is like, oh, we need to ramp up domestic oil production when we don't. And like, you know, it's, it's really scary to watch how that narrative takes hold and how much misinformation gets flooded into the media space. Does it worry you at all that this is a moment that's going to turn the wrong way where we start to, you know, remove more regulations and actually ramp up domestic oil production at a time when we need to be decarbonizing and use this as, a, as an excuse to delay decarbonization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that this is, this is a really pivotal moment and it's both an incredible threat and an incredible opportunity, which is a bit of a cliche, of course, but, but it is the moment that we find ourselves in. On the one hand, this should be the moment where we see the direct cost of our addiction to fossil fuels and we leverage 
that moment to do everything in our power to break free. I mean, there's an alternate reality here when, you know, and it's not too late to, for President Biden to do this, but he could have done it a few months ago to make a big speech and say, our addiction to fossil fuels is driving the climate crisis and empowering dictators around the world. So I'm going to declare a climate emergency and use the Defense Production Act to start a World War II style mobilization to clean energy. You know, we're going to build electric charging stations. We're going to deploy heat pumps around the world. We're going to do everything in our power to break our addiction to fossil fuels. That would be an incredible moment. <laughs> it would be an incredible moment for him to do that this summer if we're not able to see the type of transformative action we get in Congress. And honestly, it's something that we've been pushing the administration to do since day one, because this issue you know, has been at the forefront of many people's minds for a long time. And so that's the opportunity of this moment is to harness this public media moment when energy is at the top of people's minds, which it often isn't, and leverage that for real progress. The flip side of it is that we're seeing the industry do exactly that, but in the opposite direction. They're saying this, we need to increase production. We need to build Keystone XL. We need to build more LNG export facilities, you know, everything. And it comes at a really dangerous time, right? You know, the fossil fuel industry is on the defensive. Clean energy is moving around the world. Investors were really beginning to move away from fossil fuels, they're getting attacked in the courts. And so I really see this as kind of this, it's like a moment, you know, in the in Rocky or something where like you have the bad guy on the edge and then all of a sudden, you know, he comes back up off the ropes and starts landing blows, you know, and you know that a couple more knockout punches from our hero could really take him out, but we're just getting bludgeoned because of this last gasp effort. Um, and I actually remember, you know, former UN uh, Climate Secretary Christiana Figueres once said, you know, look, the, the fossil fuel industry is like someone who's drowning, you know, they're, they know they're going under, but you should never underestimate the strength of a drowning person. You know, they're going to claw their way up to the surface as, as fiercely and ferociously as they can. And I think we're seeing that right now. And I think we have to understand that in a world that is increasingly unstable and will increasingly face climate, emer climate driven emergencies, we're going to see this over and over again. I mean, this is not going to be a smooth decade where we, you know, just have an off ramp to slowly decarbonize percentage by percentage every year. This is going to be a rocky roller coaster ride uh, for the foreseeable future. And so as a climate movement, we need to be prepared for this and we need to operate much more in a kind of shock doctrine style mentality of understanding that we're going to be facing crisis after crisis after crisis, rather than assuming that we can have you know, intricate, heady policy discussions about the best ways to decarbonize. That's just not the political fight we're in. And I think that understanding that, being prepared for that, being disciplined with the messages that we're putting out is going to be really key. And it's something that, frankly, the oil and gas industry is pretty good at. And so trying to move into that space and, and push back, we might not have their money, but hopefully we have the creativity and the public movement and the mobilization pressure to leverage against that propaganda machine. You know, there's so many differences in what we're facing in 2022 versus what we were facing in the early 70s to late 70s, basically throughout the 1970s. But as you know, throughout the 1970s, the kind of shock doctrine that was implemented during that time was the exact opposite of what we needed. So many Americans were facing, if people around the world were facing energy price hikes and had really negative opinions about fossil fuel companies at the time. And unfortunately, going into the 80s, we went through this massive period of deregulation, right? Which is the exact thing that allowed companies like Exxon and all the other fossil fuel majors to gain more power, to gain more money and more influence, which is one of the things that propels them into the 80s and 90s and beyond to run all of these misinformation campaigns. We become at that inflection point and we go the complete wrong direction. That's one of the things that scares me in 2022 is you get to these crucial points and it, it allows people to do the exact wrong thing. And I just worry about, you know, what might unfold in the midterms here in the United States. Uh, we got some encouraging news last weekend out of, out of Australia, making some stronger climate moves with, with their election. But I'm just worried about what these kind of shocks can do. As you mentioned, it's a, both a great threat and a great opportunity. Uh, let's just do a therapy session here, Jamie. Like, how, do we, <laughs> how do we feel like, how do we, how do we win? 
Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. I mean, I've also been sort of up at night uh, panicking. You know, I, I actually had dreams last night that I was going from coalition meeting to coalition meeting, like talking about this, like, and I was, I had lost my luggage and, you know, it's just like your classic nightmare of like, what do we do? I'm not prepared. Um, so no, this, this keeps me up at night as well. Look, here's what I think we need to do. I, I, I think we need to first be, be really clear and confident in the solutions that we're pushing. Like technology is on our side. We have everything we need to move to clean energy. It creates better jobs. It helps low-income communities. It drives the type of economic growth we wanna see in this country. And so pushing those solutions is really critical. Second, we need to get political. We need to go up after big oil and be confident on pushing back at them. And so I'd love nothing more than to be getting more television ads on the airwaves in key states, in key districts saying, look, you're paying high prices at the pump. You want to know why? Because your member of Congress is in the pocket of this industry and they care more about getting money to those billionaires than they do about protecting you. And we need to play offense on this. And Democrats need to stop cowering away from taking on big oil and play hardball and really show that they're just as angry and just as willing to fight as the public feels like. And I think that picks up votes from the polling we've seen, not just from progressives, but from a lot of Republicans. You know, 87% of voters, according to recent polling, want to go after big oil price gouging. You know, 80% support a windfall profit tax, including 73% of Republicans. You know, this is a politically popular move, but we have to actually get it on the airwaves and really weaponize that. And then finally, we need real leadership from this White House. I think the White House has pursued a strategy of conciliatory make-believe with, you know, a senator who owns a coal company, um, you know, and, you know, that, that maybe was a potential pathway, but we've spent 18 months trying to negotiate with Joe Manchin and let a climate agenda get stalled in Congress instead of really taking bold and declarative action at the executive level and doing everything we can to address this emergency. I think the public and especially young voters really want to see this administration go out there and play hardball and say, look, until Congress acts, we're declaring a climate emergency. We're going to use the Defense Production Act. Let's get the job done. And so I guess the antidote to despair is always action, as, as the saying goes. And I think that we really need to mobilize as a movement and sort of dust ourselves off and not let this year go by without really putting up a serious fight. And so the good news is a lot of that work is happening. I think people are out there trying to get this off the ground, trying to go for it. Um, and so the question for all of us is, you know, as individual, if folks are listening to this, you know, what can you do to make that case to your neighbors? How do you push that out there? Can you donate to organizations to really support this? Can you support the candidates who are really driving this messaging forward? And you mentioned Australia. That's a really inspiring example. I mean, Australia had a terrible government in place that was going in exactly the wrong direction. And they had a total uprising that completely flipped the script in a pretty short amount of time. And so these things can swing quickly. And I think we need to believe in that potential for radical change, but it's something we have to fight for. It's not going to happen without us putting our kind of shoulder to the wheel. To circle back to the big oil windfall profits tax, what is the status of that in Congress? Is this something that could actually pass? Yeah. So, you know, it's really interesting. The, the windfall tax, we, we started pushing the idea after seeing how it really helped transform the conversation about high energy prices in the UK. So over in Europe, Italy and Spain have already passed a windfall tax that is a tax on their major oil companies that's sending money to individuals in the country to help combat energy prices. Not surprisingly, it's immensely popular. <laughs> um, you know, the fight in the UK has been interesting because it's really helped completely reshape the political conversation there. So instead of having a big debate about whether or not they should be expanding fracking and drilling in the North Sea, the debate has shifted to, should we be taxing the excess profits of these oil companies, which is a much better conversation to be having from a political perspective. And lo and behold, after months of fighting back and forth between labor and the Tories, it looks like that may now be really moving forward um, and actually beginning to be put into place ahead of this fall. And so I think we saw that happening and said, you know, look, we need to import this <laughs> to the United States. And right now it's exciting to see the momentum around this. There are a number of bills in both the House and Senate that were put together that would be different variations on the mechanism I described earlier to tax big oil and get money to consumers. We just yesterday saw a dear colleague letter, which is sort of a, a statement from multiple members of Congress in both houses um, that was sent to Speaker 
Pelosi and, and Leader Schumer asking them to bring a vote to the floor. It was signed by 46 senators and members of Congress, which is a lot for a letter like this, saying, look, we want to have a vote on windfall tax. Let's figure out the version of this we want to do and push it forward. And I think coming off the vote last week of empowering the FTC to crack down on price gouging, that was you know popular, that got a lot of attention online. I think Democrats feel empowered that this is something that they can do. Can it pass the Senate? Who knows? I mean, in a functional democracy, of course it would. I mean, it's immensely popular, as I said. You know, will Republicans uh, do anything to vote for it? Probably not. Can you convince Joe Manchin to do it? Who knows? You know, I, I don't pretend to understand the mechanisms. I would say to him, your constituents are really hurting because of this. And this is a tax on oil and gas producers, none of which are based in West Virginia. This isn't a tax on coal companies. So, you know, he should vote for it, but I, that doesn't mean he will. So we don't know if this can pass the Senate. I, I can't pretend to say it will, um, but it is a fight worth having because the more that we can put members of Congress on the record of saying, did you vote to get money to people and go after price gouging that 87% of Americans want? Or did you do something to benefit your big oil political donors? Uh, that is a good thing to have people on the record for because that's the type of thing that then you run ads about that you fight about that you talk about on the campaign trail and it's a way for us to continue to play offense on an issue that's going to be on the top of voters minds so we really want to see this bring to the floor we've got a great coalition of over 120 groups that span the range from environmental groups to tax groups to progressive groups to labor who are going to keep fighting for this and i think that that's something that we want to create momentum around and we have a little campaign website up as well called stopoilprofiteering.com and so people can go there, sign the petition, get involved in the campaign, write letters to the editor, pressure your member of Congress to take action. Um, this is a really good fight for us to be having. And I think it can make some good momentum as we head into the summer. We will link to that in the show notes. And I'll mention that at the, the end of the conversation as well. But like, even, like, as you mentioned, even if this doesn't get through Congress, bring it to the floor. Because as, as you said, so that people will vote against like make mansion and make mansion vote against it make republicans vote against it at least like get caught trying so that americans <laughs> you, know, you know what i mean like so americans no, totally. know yeah i mean look this is like this is what the republicans do all the time right you know trump, like the border wall like was it ever you know trump used the defense production act to say he was going to build a freaking border wall that was never built was always a boondoggle was always kind of a make believe project but it became a election issue. And for a portion of that base, it was an effective mobilizing tool. It was an awful thing to propose. And I wouldn't say Democrats should like make up boondoggles like that. But we have real policies that would help the American people. And we can't be afraid to fight for them. You know, people want to see Democrats do that and then point the finger and say, this is exactly why it didn't happen. Not because of democratic misfunction or because we're not willing to bring things to the floor, but because we have a opposition that's in the pocket of an industry that's screwing you over. You know, and, and that is much better than sort of sitting there on their hands and saying, well, technically it won't pass. So, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it sort of drives me nuts. The good news is I think that we need to understand that they're real advocates on our side here, too. You know, we have politicians like Representative Ro Khanna and Katie Porter and Sheldon Whitehouse and Ed Markey and others. Um, we have Sherrod Brown and Bob Casey, you know, more moderate senators who are on board with this proposal. This could happen. And I think it's on our our part to be smart about building the type of coalition that's willing to go out there and fight. I think we need more of that in the climate movement. I mean, look, I'm all for ads about spinning wind turbines and beautiful fields and solar panels shining on rooftops, but we also need to be going after the real enemy here and showing people that we're willing to fight. And so being a little bit more of a, uh, a raucous, uh, you know, energized climate movement is part of what we're up to here at Fossil Free Media and, and part of what we hope to keep pushing for as we go forward. Well, you know, inflation is going to be such a big issue in, in the midterms. And you are you seeing this be used as an excuse of fossil fuel companies by having you know high prices for saying even beyond before the war, you'd hear this argument that say, OK, well, because there is inflation, prices have to go up across the board. And as an election issue, but it just, just winning the public argument as climate activists, we need to be demonstrating why inflationary pressures are are lessened when you decarbonize, right? When you are not relying on such up and down resources like fossil fuels, how do we make that argument to 
regular average Americans who are open to decarbonizing as long as they understand that their their energy sources will be more reliable, cheaper, and more accessible. I, I think you just said it. I mean, I think that, you know, look, high energy prices are one of the primary drivers of inflation. And those prices are high because big oil is intentionally gouging us at the gas pump and profiteering off the war in Ukraine. You know, they're ga- they're inflating these energy prices and then causing the price of everything else to go up. And there's a, you know, I'm not always a fan of liberals pointing to European countries and saying, look at what Europe's doing. Um, but but I'll do it right now. Um, you know, if you look at Switzerland, Switzerland is a country that gets most of its power from hydroelectric and nuclear. Now, look, people have various opinions about hydroelectric and nuclear, but the point here is they're not relying on fossil fuels and they haven't seen any spike in their energy prices, unlike their European neighbors, and they're not facing inflation. You know, inflation hasn't gone up within the country and people aren't wrestling with it. You know, some energy prices in Europe, when you're relying on natural gas, have spiked something like 80%. In Switzerland, it's maybe gone up 2%. So, you know, it it is such a direct relation to our addiction to fossil fuels. That is driving inflation. And as you said, the transition to clean energy not only combats that problem directly, but is infusing the type of capital into the market that can really help produce efficiency across the sector and get people in the right types of jobs and ultimately lower the energy bills and other expenses that people are facing. And so, you know, we need to be explaining that in every type of medium from longer form explanatory pieces to speeches by the president to 15 second campaign ads. It needs to be a full court press across the board and there needs to be some discipline on that. There are great voices out there who are making this case, but I don't think the administration and our political leaders have taken up this message. They're sort of playing both sides of the equation here, doing that on the one hand, but then also traveling to Saudi Arabia to talk to OPEC about increasing production. I mean, it just, it, it becomes discordant. And I think this kind of triangulation that we often see from democratic administrations where they try and sort of play both sides and play nice with everybody, you know, it just isn't effective. And I think that there needs to be a lot more clarity that this is a moment to really point to the type of solutions we need, bring the fight, to big oil that's causing this problem and move forward. So as advocates, we'll do everything we can to make the case, but uh, it sure would be nice to have some help from uh, the bully pulpit and uh, other uh, you know mechanisms out there that could get this message across. Yeah, I mean, obviously it would be so nice to see President Biden go out and talk about our addiction to fossil fuels. My goodness, George W. Bush did that. Which I know. Was his- no, it, <laughs> I, I, you want a depressing moment. You know, I, I went back after the State of the Union and looked back at sort of how much climate had been talked about, you know, by by every other president. And um, it is a little bit wild to go back. And as you said, you know, read Bush. I mean, Bush was a monster in many ways. I'm, I'm not trying to say he was some sort of climate hero, but the guy was talking about the need to break our addiction to fossil fuels and become energy independent. And you're like, what happened to this? And and again, it's a reminder that we've been pushed into the, this weird political corner where we somehow have convinced ourselves that the public isn't with us. The public is with us. You know, the public wants to get off fossil fuels. The public does not like big oil companies. This is a popular issue. And one of the most effective pieces of propaganda for the industry has been to convince Democrats and climate advocates that the public isn't on their side. You know, I see people cowering and saying, oh, well, we still need to convince people global warming is a crisis. Um, You know, voters don't care about this issue. We have to convince people clean energy works. It's like, guys, you know, climate was the number one voting issue for young people last election. It is a top concern for Democrats. It's a top concern for many Republicans. Um, This is popular and we cannot be gaslit by this industry into thinking that we are, you know, uh, like cowering in caves with hair shirts on trying to tell people this message. Um, We need to be really confident going out there and fighting for what we believe in. Are there more steps that you can take in or beyond just the the windfall profits tax to help people with their energy bills while still having the direction of decarbonization? Are there other things you'd like to see Congress do in 2022 to kind of help people in the long term and the short term? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, I think in general, we have to be designing climate policy with individuals and families much more in mind. There's a temptation because the crisis is so big to only go for big distant projects. And those are important. I'm not saying that it's not, but you know, we just authorized, you know, $500 million for a green hydrogen facility out of the desert in Utah. 
okay, fine. You know, I used to live in Utah. I think that's cool. It's interesting, but it's not the type of project where someone says, wow, you know, that, that sure helping me reduce my electricity bills. I'd like to see many more programs. And there's some of this in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but not nearly enough. There's quite a lot of it in the bill that's languishing in Congress right now that's really targeted directly at consumers. You're going to get a tax credit for getting an electric bicycle. You get a zero interest loan to retrofit your home and put up solar panels, or God forbid, we actually just pay for it directly because we know that that's a good way to drive down costs and inflation. We're going to invest in public transit. Your kid is gonna to ride to school on an electric bus that isn't you know, giving them asthma. Really show people the benefits of the transition and create momentum in that way. You know, My dream would be that every week, you know, the president or senior officials are going around cutting ribbons on clean energy projects that aren't some giant wind turbine somewhere, although they can do that, do that too, but are much more focused on the individual level. You know, it's funny, it, people used to make fun of Trump going around and saying, you know, you can't even flush your toilet anymore. Like your dishwasher won't get your dishes clean. But hey, there's a reason they talk about those things because that's what people see in their home. And so it doesn't matter how much they like wind turbines off the coast of the Atlantic if they feel like their dishwasher sucks you know, because they use their dishwasher every day. And so I think it's really smart. I like the push people are doing around, you know, induction stoves and showing that people really like those, you know, bringing this issue down to the personal level in a compelling way is something that we can do a better job of. And I think there's ways to design our policies so that it feels like they're revolving around that level and getting people excited about it and showing that their individual actions can be part of systemic change. I think we sometimes create this false dichotomy of like, you can't tell people they can do things individually because they need to be focused on system change. I, I've been, I've, I've said that myself at certain points, but I think that's maybe a false way to think about it. I think there's ways of really helping people get convinced that the changes they're making in their own lives are creating real benefits for themselves and are part of a, a national and international movement to really go in a new direction. Absolutely. It's an, it's empowering. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit because, you know, before this fossil free media launched the, the campaign clean creatives, which is absolutely fascinating. What is the aim of clean creatives? Sure. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about how do we get our message out there, but part of the problem with climate is that, you know, it doesn't do much good if you're getting your message out there and then it's completely getting drowned out by millions of dollars of spending on the other side. And we, we came up against this time and time again. And so my colleague, Duncan, who's really directing the Clean Creative Campaign and, and gets a lot of credit for, for making it such a success, he and I work together at 350.org and especially on fossil fuel divestment and Keystone XL. And you know, on those campaigns, saw these multi-million dollar flashy ad efforts coming after us. And so as we were thinking about our work at Fossil Free Media, we said, you know, wait a second. Yeah, these ads aren't being made by ExxonMobil. They're being made by a PR firm and an ad can industry, you know, an, an ad agency. And those people are a really valuable target that we can go after. And so the effort of Clean Creatives is pressuring PR and ad agencies to take a pledge to say, we're no longer going to work with fossil fuel companies to spread climate disinformation. And so it's really modeled on the fossil fuel divestment movement, but going after a new sector, which is public relations. And so it's been a really major success, actually. You know, I think that PR and ad agencies are very sensitive about their brand and about their image. Um, all of them want to be seen as sustainable and forward-looking, um, and they've been getting away with this contradiction that on the one hand, they're pitching themselves to Patagonia and Cliff Bar and REI, and on the other, they're working for uh, ExxonMobil and Chevron and Shell. And so we've had a lot of success. You know, Now nearly 300 agencies around the world have signed our pledge to not work with fossil fuel companies. And just as importantly, we've got a foot in the door at the world's largest PR companies and ad agencies at every single one, their employees who are organizing internally to really push these multi-billion dollar behemoths to really move in the right direction. And we've been exposing a lot of these uh, ad campaigns, probably most successfully going after Edelman, which is the largest PR firm in the world, who has a you know climate pledge and brags about its sustainability. I mean, these guys are, they worked for the American Petroleum Institute for over a decade and made hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, attacking climate policy. And they continue to this day to work for Exxon, 
um, and other oil companies, you know, spreading their propaganda. And so I think we've helped reveal that, helped get stories in the New York Times, you know, going after them, helped push Edelman to, you know, take these pledges, which are mostly greenwashing still, but it shows we're making some progress. And we're going to keep that up. And it, I think it's just, it's an untapped area. You know, climate is a political fight and a narrative fight just as much as a scientific problem. And so getting the most brilliant marketing minds in the world to stop working for the fossil fuel industry and start putting their talents toward climate solutions could be a real key part of this struggle. And it's it's exciting to see that just within, you know, just over a year, this kind of fledgling campaign has really been able to transform the conversation within that space. And I think we'll continue to make some real progress going forward. Yeah, because I, I think it's fascinating because as these fossil fuel companies start to lose power with you know losing profit, they're going to continue to look to external partners, right, in order to be able to latch on the talent. You talked about Edelman. You know, there's going to be talented people that go to work for Edelman that wouldn't go work for Exxon Mobil, right, because it doesn't have. And then who wants to work for Exxon Mobil, right? Unless you unless you absolutely have to, right? But like you can tap into talent through having like an agency partner and you know broadening it out. We see the ways in which, you know, the, the New York Times, for instance, their media lab, their advertising media lab will partner with fossil fuel companies to leverage the, the brand of the New York Times to, you know, create these advertorials for fossil fuel companies. And you see this over and over again, where fossil fuel companies will just find talented partners to continue misinformation or greenwashing campaigns. I wonder if we're experiencing any kind of shift though i I saw you know this week caroline dennett the the safety consultant for shell very publicly resigned uh citing uh the company's climate failures and continued uh, climate denial u.n secretary antonio gutierrez uh urged college students at a seton hall graduation to not work for quote-unquote climate records you know how do we make the the broader argument that talented people shouldn't touch you know talented frankly talented people who have the option of where they can work or where where they want to work how do we make that that more clear that whether you're working for a pr firm or an ad studio that working for a fossil fuel company is ruining your own future like what's the strategy that we need to employ here yeah i it's a good question i mean i i think it's really trying to maintain Maintain clarity in a murky space. The fossil fuel industry really tries to make things complicated by saying, oh, but we're, you know, helping on the transition or investing in algae or whatever it is. And they want to shift the debate to whether or not that's true. It isn't true. I mean, they're investing pennies into that sort of technology and the 99% of their capital expenditures are going into more oil and gas. But we need to be really clear about drawing bright lines here and saying, look, these companies have spent decades spreading misinformation. So the burden of proof is on them to show that they actually have a credible, scientifically variable, verifiable plan to completely decarbonize. And before then, we're just not going to work with you anymore. And, you know, I think it is very powerful to draw the parallel to big tobacco. Is it the exact perfect metaphor? No, of course not. But, you know, it's an equivalent where it is a industry that's stigmatized and these firms will not, you know, work with big tobacco pretty much every tech platform has a policy that says we don't advertise dangerous products uh, and they don't advertise firearms and tobacco. Well, that's great, but fossil fuels are killing far more people every year than firearms and tobacco. So why are they continuing to advertise fossil fuel disinformation? Um, And that's something that I think is really important. So there are great campaigns, as you said, going after these different areas. Clean Creatives is tackling the ad agencies and PR companies. Our partners at End Climate Silence are going after a lot of the media agencies. You mentioned the New York Times. They've been pressuring them and NPR and others to drop advertising. And then Friends of the Earth and a whole coalition of groups are going after the tech platforms um, and disinformation. And there's great reports out there. There's a group called Influence Map, which is a think tank based out of the UK that's kind of tracked the fossil fuel industry industries disinformation out online and they just put out a fascinating report about how the industry has been trying to take advantage of the war in Ukraine. And so I think people are getting clear on this. And as you said, you know, these public resignations make a big 
difference. Like, and people should not underestimate their ability. If you work for one of these agencies or you work in the industry, those, those resignations, if you can do it, or that whistleblowing and that public confrontation captures public imagination right now. And so I know it's risky for people. And I, I wouldn't say if you're a junior level associate who's trying to pay off college debt, you know, you know, maybe not for you, but if you're in a senior role right now, now is the moment. Like we are, we are at the crest of a wave potentially of this change happening. And so I think it's exciting to see people beginning to say those things publicly. I think we need to encourage that and it can make a major impact. I mean, I remember in the fossil fuel divestment campaign when this was really taking off in the UK and Shell tried to go recruit engineers at Cambridge University, which is, you know, the MIT of the UK and not a single student showed up to their recruitment meeting, which used to be full auditoriums because who didn't want to go work for a really rich oil company. And that got right back to the CEO and freaked them out. And they said, we have a huge problem on our hands. And so, you know, that was, that was pretty targeted organizing at Cambridge to make that happen. The same thing should be happening here at MIT, at Stanford, at, at you know, other schools. And so, you know, it, it, these industries are behemoths, right? Like they feel like these impenetrable giants. We call it big oil, you know, but they're, they're it's like the Wizard of Oz. You know, you, you can find the levers that pull back the curtain and show that these companies are much more vulnerable. And I think, as you said, going after the pillars of support that prop up this industry, the law firms, the PR agencies, the consultants, you know, all the people they rely on to maintain their stranglehold over our political and economic system. That is a really effective strategy to take them on. And it's super exciting to see that happening in just about every sector. So I, I think along with the political work we've talked about, those strategic campaigns to go after these pillars are incredibly important. Are, are there pitfalls though in organizing against fossil fuel companies? You know, if you're an investigative journalist and there's been so much incredible investigative journalism into fossil fuel companies, especially the last decade, exposing the crimes of the fossil fuel industry is a no-brainer, right? It's great journalism. If you're a litigator, if you're an attorney general, bringing these climate liability lawsuits against fossil fuel companies, well, it's a no-brainer. There's been demonstrable damage done by climate in information. I have to imagine organizing is trickier. When you're running a campaign and trying to convince people to rally against fossil fuel companies, well, you know, people use still have to use fossil fuel companies. Maybe they know someone or have a family tie to someone that works in a fossil fuel company. And, you know, that can be the difference between that and like big tobacco, right? As people still feel like they, well, they, they have to on some level still burn oil and gas to maintain their, their sort of standard of living. How do you sort of make that tricky balance to make sure people are organizing for a better future while not kind of moving against the climate movement. I have to imagine you have to strike a good balance there. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And I think that, you know, that it's a good, it's a good thing for us to really keep in mind. And we don't always do it perfectly. I mean, I think that we, we have to remember that our target really is the CEOs and executives of these companies. You know, it's not people that work in the oil industry. It's certainly not people that work at gas stations or are trying to make a living um, in many parts of this country. Those are the only jobs that are available for people. And again, those people are, have the skills and technology we're going to need not only to transition to clean energy. We often have this image of former coal miners putting up solar panels. But it is going to be a decades long struggle to deal with the oil and gas infrastructure that needs to be plugged, maintained, decommissioned. We need those workers working in oil and gas uh, for decades to come. And we need to be better about articulating that. And it's really exciting to see some fledgling efforts from, you know, people who are trying to unionize the clean energy sector to groups that are working with oil and gas workers to plug abandoned wells. I think the climate movement needs to get serious about not just saying just transition over and over again, but finding ways to actually go in and help support that. And it's really exciting to see, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Greenpeace was out there in Richmond, California, supporting steel workers who are on strike at the Chevron refinery. And, you know, those folks don't always see eye to eye. I've, I've sat in in front of the Chevron refinery as well. And I know Greenpeace has, but it was really cool to see people working together and saying, look, you know, our fight isn't with you. You know, we're trying to change this company and make it for the better for all of us either way. And so I think that sort of solidarity across the sector is really important. And, and we should be clear with that in our messaging. And I think we don't always do a good job of that. I think that, you know, in the, in the desire to 
polarize and be clear and be effective, which we need to do, the nuance of that position doesn't always come through. And so finding ways to identify great spokespeople in the sector, to make strategic alliances, to be really clear that this is about the CEOs and not workers is really key. And to give people the permission to feel like, look, I drive a gas car too, you know? And like, we're not trying to say you need to be a purist here. We're trying to say, this is exactly why we're, we need this transition, you know, because these opportunities aren't available to people right now to go 100% electric tomorrow. And that's why we need this sort of legislative and major change we've been talking about so that average people can make the transition, make their lives better, get the type of technology they need. You know, we talked about the success they had in Australia last weekend, a lot of the great things that are happening in Europe. And the United States were in this position, as we talked about, where major climate legislation 18 months in, as, as you mentioned, has not come through. And I think it's been a real, it really has kind of dampened the momentum in the climate movement. I've certainly felt that, maybe I'm just, uh, it's just sort of projecting here, but certainly feeling kind of downtrodden that there hasn't been major national legislation. And it just shows you the continued power of large fossil fuel companies, and not just with Republicans, although you have 50 senators, 50 Republican senators that just won't do a damn thing on climate. You see this influence, as you mentioned, with uh, Joe Manchin and Cole. You still see fossil fuel companies have this immense power. You know, we're talking just days after this horrific shooting in Texas. So many people are, are talking about the NRA and the gun lobby being just able to keep any kind of progressive legislation um, on, on gun control from happening. And I think when you don't see action, you know, as, as you mentioned, action can be the, the antidote to the despair. When you don't see action, it can be so dispiriting. Like, how do we overcome the lack of movement here in the United States by Congress to rally the climate movement to do more in 2022? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I, I think the last year and a half has been hard. I mean, the combination of COVID, uh, you know, the war, these terrible shootings, uh, you know, the terrible examples of, of racial injustice in this country, like it, it is a hard moment. And I think it is real for people to feel a certain sense of exhaustion and despair. And so, yeah, I just, you know, I, I feel that too. And I think we need to wrestle with that. That said, I think that we can sometimes forget, as I was saying earlier, how strong we really are and how much resilience we have as individuals, but also as a movement. You know, people can't see, but on my walls around me, you know, I have posters from the People's Climate March. You know, that was the largest, one of the largest marches in US history. And it was for climate. You know, that was just a few years ago. Um, there's banners up from the fight against Keystone XL. You know, we stopped this multi-billion dollar pipeline and laid the groundwork for resistance against fossil fuel infrastructure all across the country. You can't build a fossil fuel project without seeing major fights on the ground. So this movement is strong, it is vibrant, it is led from the front lines, it has incredible leadership from indigenous people, from black communities, from, from you know, it, it's just incredible the more you sink your teeth into it. And it feels great to be a part of it. I mean, that's why I've stayed in this fight for 15 years, not because it's like real fun to stare into the apocalyptic abyss every day, but because you just meet the most incredible people and get to be part of really world-changing events. So I guess my pep talk would be, you can, you can really make change with a few people. I mean, we've seen this. I think our friends in the UK have done a pretty amazing job, whether it's you know, the stop oil actions that have been taking place where, you know, one guy got on a football pitch and locked himself to the goalpost. And it was like national news, you know, about banning oil. Um, you know, there's, there's been actions where here in the U.S. people dragged a sailboat into the middle of Times Square, you know, and disrupted traffic and got incredible amounts of attention. It doesn't have to be civil disobedience, although that is a powerful tool. Um, but you can find ways to really create momentum and get excitement going. And so, you know, again, I would say climate can feel paralyzing because it feels like, oh, you have to do the biggest thing possible and what does it matter? But, but little actions well-designed can be a lot of fun and can get you out in the streets with your friends and really create a change. And so I'd love to see people get out there fighting again. We're trying to do that with this incredible People vs. Fossil Fuels Coalition, which is a whole collection of groups who are planning more actions, going to be doing a lot around drilling on public lands over the coming months. Um, we're doing that with clean creatives. You know, we're, we're trying to throw as much as we can at the wall. And I would say, because climate touches everything, 
no matter where you work, no matter where you sit, no matter what you're involved in, there's an opportunity for you to leverage that position, um, whether you're an artist, a teacher, a bus driver, whatever it is, and try and create some change. And so I think you're right. I think we got to stop overthinking it, <laughs> stop beating ourselves up and get back in the streets and, and see what we can do to make a difference. For people who want to, you know, use, give their, their time, their attention and their money to the amazing things that you're working on. Again, we will link to it in the show notes, but people are not going to check the show notes. Where should they go to, to learn more about what you're working on, Jamie? Yeah, well, people should obviously go to your website and check out the show notes. It's always good to do, but um, but I'll mention a few places. Um, fossil free dot media is our you know little website about the broader work that we're doing. But the great, the best places to get involved are um, Clean Creatives for cleancreatives.org is out there. If you're working in the ad industry or PR industry, or you're in a creative sector, especially, we'd love to get you involved and, and make you an advocate for that. Stop stopoilprofiteering.com is the you know, the, the effort we're doing going after price gouging and pushing for windfall profits tax it is a great, super, you know, campaign of the moment. I mean, this is going to be a real fight over the coming weeks. And so getting involved there to write letters to the editor, to put pressure on your members of Congress, we need you there. And then people versus fossil fuels, Org is, again, this broader you know, group of 1,200 different organizations who are fighting frontline fossil fuel projects, who are pushing for bolder action from the federal government, pushing President Biden to declare a climate emergency. Um, it is a really great coalition to get involved in, and it can plug you in to different fights that are happening in your area. And then finally, you know, our allies at 350, at Sunrise, at the Sierra Club, elsewhere, there, there are climate local groups and chapters in every state and every city across this country. And so do not feel like you're alone. Um, your neighbors care about this issue. They want to get engaged. And uh, hey, you know, going down to your city hall or wherever it is and doing a creative action is a great way to push for it. Um, going out to a gas station and recording a TikTok video, uh, explaining to people, big oil is profiteering. This is the reason prices are going up. Um, that stuff matters. That makes a huge difference. So I'd encourage people, whether you like being part of groups and like going to meetings, or you just like doing things on your own, <laughs> I, I can identify with both. There's a great way for people to take action. And finally, you know, share these podcasts and educate yourselves. This podcast is incredible. You've had great speakers. I'm honored to be a part of them. Um, there's great pieces like um, the Mad Men of Climate Denial, everything that Amy Westervelt and, and Mary do is incredible listening to that. And there are great resources out there that really explain how this disinformation works and, and what we can do to push back against it. So it's just, a, it's a constant privilege to be part of this incredible sector of, of people making a difference. And um, I'd encourage everybody to find a way to get involved. Well, Jamie, so glad to have, for finally have you on this show. Thank you so much for all the incredible work you're doing. And you've been so gracious with your time this morning. So I really, really appreciate it. Jamie Hen, thank you again for joining us on the Climate Pod. Brock, thank you. It was great.